heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Grand Theft Auto 6. It's out with its official trailer as it teases ahead. It's launched in 2025. We'll break down what it means for Take-Two's bottom line in the gaming industry. Plus, Bite Dance and GoTo strike a deal to save Indonesia's TikTok shop in what may be a template for other e-commerce markets around the world. We'll discuss. Plus, Meta and IBM join forces with 40 other companies to create an AI alliance. We'll discuss the implications and the open source focus with the CEO of AI company, Arthur. That's later this hour. First, let's check in on these markets. And it's a macro picture of the jobs data, just showing a little bit of cooling. Probably music to the Federal Reserve's ears. So it means stocks just get a little bit of a push higher after yesterday's sell-off. We're off by about two-tenths of a percent on the Nasdaq. Not big moves, but keep an eye on them. We're certainly seeing 10-year yields sink back down again, some eight basis points as people anticipate. Maybe the Fed can continue to be more dovish. Looking at Bitcoin, though, just tearing itself away from the other risk assets, managing to push higher even as we see stocks and bonds sell-off yesterday and continuing to defy that 42,732 is where we trade. So bulls back in charge when it comes to Bitcoin. Move on and have a look at what happened from a technology perspective in trading in Europe. Ed, this was the London Stock Exchange, its third technical fault in three months, an outage that impacted certain tech names that we know, Deliveroo, for example, ASOS Trading. Both had, of course, these outages throughout the day. In fact, the overall parent company just down by some five tenths percent. But this ain't looking good for the London Stock Exchange parent company. There's one story that a lot of people are talking about online, and that is Grand Theft Auto 6 is coming in 2025. We're going to get the details of our reporter in just a second. There's excitement, but also disappointment, particularly in the shares of Take-Two Interactive. That's the parent company of Rockstar, the studio that's making Grand Theft Auto 6. Shares lower, and basically the sell side is saying... 2025? When in 2025? Why so far away? Why is it not coming sooner? Remember that the trailer leaked, so then Take-Two had to put out the, the version formally earlier than expected. This is massive. The previous generation of Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto 5, has just sold tens and tens of millions of copies around the world. Let's get some more details and bring in our video game reporter, Cecilia DiAnastasio. Give our audience on Bloomberg Technology the what they need to know about Grand Theft Auto 6. Yeah, Grand Theft Auto 6 is one of the most anticipated video games of all time. Grand Theft Auto itself has been around since 1997, and since then it's only become more popular. Grand Theft Auto 5, the predecessor to the upcoming game, has been around for 10 years, and over that time has sold over 190 million copies and generated $8.4 billion in revenue. That's so much. So Grand Theft Auto 6, um, has a lot to live up to, and fans were happy with the trailer. It looked mm -hmm. fantastic. I mean, this is all about just more immersion, more almost cinematic experience, and a female protagonist. That seems to be some of the key takeaways. What else was impressing people? Grand Theft Auto 6 returns to Vice City, which is like a very beloved location with the franchise. Um, I saw fans commenting. I saw the shot of the skyscrapers, this one in particular. Um, that the graphics look spectacular. And there is a lot of excitement um, around the female co-protagonist for the game. It's a very, like, you know, um, heist-type dynamic that we might have seen in <laughs> movies that are very popular. Uh, Cecilia, the deets confirm a lot of what we've reported, but how they handled this, like, it's never smooth. There was a leak. They mm. were due to put the official trailer out Tuesday, today, this morning, and then they published early. Just explain the rollout, I guess, of, of Grand Theft Auto 6. Sure. Because this game is so anticipated, leaks are something that were bound to happen to some degree. There was a very large leak of Grand Theft Auto 6 footage a long time ago, a couple, um, a couple months ago. And um, unfortunately for Rockstar and for Take Two, um, the trailer for this game that was so anticipated leaked um, a day ahead of when it was planned. Fans seemed very happy with the trailer, which is great for Rockstar, but I'm sure developers there were very disappointed. 
Well, we'll have to see how this continues to unfold. And, of course, the anticipation until 2025. Perhaps that was some of the impact on the share price. Bloomberg Video Games reporter Cecilia D'Anastasio, we love you jumping on. Thank you. Let's get more on the conversation for the entire gaming ecosystem. We're really pleased to welcome Amy Wu, partner at Menlo Ventures, leading gaming consumer blockchain investments. Previously, of course, you did the same at Lightspeed. And, Amy, I mean, you've been playing GTA for what, more than decades. I'm, I'm interested in what you think about the rollout and ultimately why these things take so long to produce. Yeah, these games are incredibly difficult to produce. I, I would say that AAA games these days, well, you know, which are high fidelity games made by studios, you know, like uh, like Rockstar, you know, like the Activision Blizzard studios, um, they, they typically do take over five plus years. You know, there's a lot of uh, 3D modeling involved, and you know, you can see from the trailer the cinematic graphics, very lifelike. You know, people that they have um, in in the game, the complexity of the open world game, where players can really let their their imagination run wild and sort of endless content. Uh, you know, these things take a very long time and years in development, hundreds of game developers. And in the case of GTA 6, you know, there's all sorts of speculation about how um, what the costs were to develop. GTA 5 was rumored at around, you know, 200 million and um, possibly over five times that for GTA 6. I want to go back to the numbers on, on GTA 5 because it was released in September of 2013, more than 10 years ago. So we're saying 190 million copies sold in that time, $8.4 billion of revenue. By the way, in the last fiscal year, Take Two did about $5.4 billion overall. So like, it's important. How has the audience changed, Amy, from September of 2013 to now? How has the market changed? Yeah, I would say that since 2013, you already see that by 2013. Uh, in the last 10 years of gaming, you've seen a lot of more diversity of the types of players to come into the ecosystem. So first there was the rise of mobile gaming, which actually brought in a lot of females, older players. You know, historically gaming has been more dom male dominated, younger audiences. That is still a core audience today. But you can see from, you know, female protagonists and also from some of the more, again, like movie-like qualities of the, uh, you know, of the game. Uh, GTA has always been about role playing, and they really want to embrace all types of different players, the different game experiences they want. Maybe some are more into driving, more into shooting, and others into, uh, you know, actually running a store, etc. And that's why, for example, in GTA 5, the role playing mod was so popular in that game because it really allowed different types of gameplay and for people to also stream that gameplay on TikTok and YouTube and others places. Big time. When I was talking about 2013, producer John Highland piped into my ear and said, don't forget Red Dead Redemption 2, 2018, another rock star title. Caro was talking about how you've played GTA. Right, great game. Um, what does this mean for you? I mean, when you, when you saw the trailer and you saw the announcement, what was your genuine reaction to that? I was pumped, you know, just like most people. Yeah, I played a lot of GTA growing up. You know, for me, it was it was actually Vice City, which GTA uh, 6 is set oh, back in. Oh, big time. And yeah, and so, you know, this game kind of defined my gaming childhood along with a few other titles. And so just being able to see just such an incredible fidelity, um, it, I'm sure it's going to be way more immersive. And so I, I'm personally like it's 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 the most anticipated title of, of uh, 2025 and for me as well. Interweave, therefore, how people are now purchasing within games, how we have seen Web3 integrate itself, and many, to use analogies of crypto and Web3, basically pointed to gaming and to Fortnite and the like, Amy. What does this sort of a title do to the companies you're looking at and the economics of the companies that you're looking at? It's a really good question. So at Menlo, we invest in uh, early stage game studios and also gaming tools. And I would say that, you know, these days, AAA games like GTA 6 uh, do command sort of hundreds of millions of dollars of development cost. And so there's, as a venture investor, a question that we have all the time is, how does a new studio compete against the budgets that these large studios uh, have? 
Um, and also, you know, because they're launching new, uh, the next game in a franchise that's already beloved by millions of players versus a, a, a young studio is really launching new IP. And so we think about that when we're investing in games. I think the bar is, uh, is very high. And so startup studios really have to go after game concepts that have, you know, and that are either on top of a new platform, you know, like like Roblox or uh, that you know, UEFN or um, the AR VR, or they're creating a new genre or doing something very special in a new genre in order to break out in what is a very competitive landscape. There is also a discussion to be had about the role of generative AI technology in the development, right? I wonder if games like GTA 6 will kind of be the last big titles where multi-year development is justified. Is that an area you're looking at, kind of generative AI as a way to speed up how quickly new games can come to market? Absolutely. You know, I'm, as an investor, as a venture investor, I'm very excited about AI tooling, generative AI tooling that can lower the cost of content development, which is the most expensive part of game making. And uh, and hopefully that gives a leg up for some of these indie studios. But you have to consider that when these gen AI tools become more mature and creating game assets or characters, you know, they will be most likely adopted by both young studios and incumbent studios alike. And so I think that we will continue to see uh, long multi-year game cycles for the years to come, but hopefully that does come down with the uh, with invention of these um, tools. And just broaden out, we have sort of seen geographically interesting regulatory hurdles that, for example, Chinese games game makers have been suffering or or having to jump across, whichever way, that, whether you think it's positive or not, Amy. More broadly, these sorts of titles, will they be global in their making? And are the companies that you're backing and the studios that you're looking at investing in, do they need to have a global offering at this moment? We are looking, I, I do think the most successful games today do appeal to global audiences. And when we think about global audiences, we think about gamer tastes. And so Western gamers oftentimes have different tastes and game style, how games are monetizing than necessarily Eastern uh, players. And so studios need to think about different preferences uh, and also for different demographics uh, that, uh, that are different by region. I think that's more important than necessarily Eastern each country alone and also how um, you know what the willingness to pay is for for players in different markets Amy Wu video games partner at Menlo Ventures just great on a day like today to have you on the show thank you so much for your time now coming up here on Bloomberg technology we're going to take a look at the impact of the Israel Hamas war on Israel's tech sector with Shlomo Dovrat he's a co-founder of tech investment group Viola a giant in that country's market, Caro, and he's in town for some pretty key tech meetings as well. And look, we are going global in our discussion because there's a really interesting sort of transatlantic conversation going on at the moment with Nokia and Ericsson. Just keep an eye on these particular companies because, well, Ericsson has beaten out Nokia, its rival, when it comes to offerings to AT&T. Now, it's notable that AT&T was it's a $14 billion deal, in fact. AT&T wanting to modernize its US wireless network, and it's basically tapped Ericsson to do so. Shares of Nokia are actually really hurt hard at one point off by 10% in European trading. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. The latest on the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's government says it plans to offer whatever financial support and other assistance is needed to protect the country's tech startup industry from the impacts of the war. Meanwhile, Israel is expanding military operations in southern Gaza, even as U.S. officials are growing uneasy about the war's toll on civilians. We want to bring in Shlomo Dovrat to unpack all of this. He is the co-founder and general partner of Viola, Israel's largest tech investment group, $5 billion in assets under management. He was also appointed by the Israeli government to chair the National Task Force for the Advancement of the Educational System. And you are here in San Francisco and visiting Silicon Valley uh, for a series of meetings with your industry. Let's start there. What, what brings you to the West Coast, and who have you been meeting with? So I've been a frequent visitor to the Silicon Valley probably over now 40 years. I'm on the board of Unity 
You spoke about games. Actually, a lot of the games that you're talking about are powered by Unity. Right. It was merged with one of our portfolio companies. I have several portfolio companies. We have a big conference here. A lot of the relationships. So I'm a frequent visitor to Silicon Valley and, uh, and this area. In the context of the Israel-Hamas war and what is happening in your, your homeland, home country, what are the conversations that you are having right now? So I'm, we are overwhelmed with the amount of support. You know, Israel was viciously attacked on October 7th by uh, an, a terrorist organization which is really very close to ISIS. And uh, we had over a thousand uh, civilians slaughtered. And we're getting a lot of uh, really amazing support from everybody that we talk to in the tech ecosystem. I must say, even with the Western leadership, yes, we are seeing some uh, pro-Palestinian uh, demonstration in London and in other areas. But they are mostly, I think, by people who are not aware of the situation. This has nothing to do with Israel and Palestine. This has to do with radical terror, uh, you know, Islamist terror. And Israel has launched this war as a defense. Uh, you know, just a few hours ago, I spoke with my wife. We had missiles shot in, on Tel Aviv. She had to go to shelter and then come out. This is a, has been our reality, and Israel has really no choice but to go out. And with all the heartbreaking uh, news that are coming out of Gaza, we need to defend uh, our country, and we need to eliminate this risk and to remove Hamas uh, so that they cannot really yeah. anymore threaten our country. Shlomo, of course, Hamas is a designated terrorist organization by the U.S. and the EU, but we, we move aside from what protests people are at or flags they're flying or religions they're from to really focus on what is being built from a technology perspective. We've spoken to those that have funded Palestinian companies built in Gaza and we've also spoken to those who are building in Israel and of course Israel so focused from a GDP perspective on the economy of technology, the startups. It's interesting to note that what is about $100 million in a publicly funded agency money is going to be rolled out this month, we understand, by the Israel Innovation Authority. But if you're going to get that grant, if you're going to be able to access that $100 million, you have to basically be getting matching funds from the private sector. How willing are VCs, how willing is the private sector to invest in the startup community in Israel right now? So, you know, the, the tech uh, ecosystem in Israel is really second only to the United States. We are, for example, the third largest ecosystem that invests in generative AI. Uh, the investors that are investing in Israel are used to the fact that Israel does have a conflict and we live in a very complicated area. We have seen uh, continued support of Israeli tech. Uh, we've seen uh, two, you know, recent acquisition by Palo Alto Securities of Israeli companies for over a billion dollar just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we are seeing investment. Obviously, the fact that people don't come to Israel, don't go out of Israel as frequently does slow down. But Israeli companies are very resilient. We just ran a very big campaign uh, on Nasdaq and we had like a big billboard on, on the Times Square saying we deliver no matter what. Israeli companies are very used to this situation. But even the investors, I must say, are continuing to invest. We just completed uh, two investments in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, we are doing joint investments with our U.S. Uh, colleagues. Uh, even our Emirati uh, investors are continuing to invest. So I think they, there is some disruption, obviously, but I'm not really worried about it. And by the way, the $100 million is a very small part mm -hmm. of the Israeli tech ecosystem uh, investment. We are running about $6 billion uh, of investments a year, and I expect actually this would be very close to that annual number. Well, well said, because to that point, what was about five and a half billion was raised last year alone by the tech ecosystem in Israel. A hundred million seems barely anything. Should the government, should these sorts of Israel innovation authorities be doing more to help incentivize private money, or is that not necessary? I don't think it is necessary. I think the, I, I don't believe in government subsidizing investments in technology. I think that hundred million dollar is a very important plan, but it's only directed to very young you know, companies who don't have enough uh, private sector funding. It's a small portion. You know, we ourselves are managing billions of dollars, much more than what the government can do. And I don't think that, the, I think the government would need to allow uh, the condition for Israeli uh, tech ecosystem to continue and thrive by supporting things like education, university, research, etc. But the private sector in Israel is extremely strong, and I don't think we are dependent so much on the Israeli government. When the Israel-Hamas war started, one of the things that Caroline and I discussed in the program was the workforce. Intel, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google have many employees Correct. there away from the private startup ecosystem. Correct. Mobileye is Israel's most valuable company by market cap, which Correct. not tech company, company. Right. 
What is going to be the technology story for Israel going forward, thematically or in, in a, spe a specialized discipline? So I, I think, you know, Israel has been very uh, agile in the way when, when you look at innovation cycles, and I've been here around for a long time. We had the cellular, we had the Internet, then we had the mobile social cloud. Now, obviously, the new innovation cycle, the most exciting cycle is AI. Israel is in the front in, uh, in AI investments, over $3 billion only in uh, generative AI startups in the last three years, second only to uh, the U.S. and China, although in China you never really know what the real numbers are. I think AI will drive innovation. When you think about Mobileye, Mobileye all of the Mobileye value that was created by my dear friend Amnon Shashua was based on AI abilities to understand uh, uh, visual pictures and, and you know, process billions of uh, data points in, in nanoseconds and make, you know, very intelligent uh, uh, decisions. So I think AI will be the main driving force. I think enterprise IT innovation is going to be very important. A lot of the innovation we've seen to date has to do with consumer. When you think about mobile, social, and cloud, this has all evolved around uh, the consumer life. I think it's time that we see construction, agriculture, uh, automotive, aerospace, going through the same type of innovation that we saw in uh, consumer. And I'm sure Israel will lead the way. Shlomo Dovrat, co-founder, general partner of Viola. Thank you for visiting us here in SF. Caroline. Now coming up, Ed, we're going to go global again. First of its kind partnership, actually, happening with the TikTok parent company, ByteDance. More why it's teaming up with Indonesia's go-to for its TikTok shop platform. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. First up, a former employee of Apple supplier Alps Alpine is now in custody of Japanese police. Officers arrested the suspect for allegedly stealing trade secrets. The person is believed to be a Chinese national. Alps is working with authorities but declined to provide more details. And China is pushing back against remarks made by U.S. Commentary Secretary Gina Raimondo. During a defense forum last weekend, Raimondo called for more funds to curb China's ability to make chips. China's foreign ministry responded, saying the U.S. should, quote, stop seeing China as a hypothetical enemy. Plus, ByteDance reaching a deal to invest in Tokopedia, an online shopping service run by Indonesia-based firm GoTo. That, according to Bloomberg sources, details of the partnership still being worked out, but the pair favor working together rather than against each other. Teaming with GoTo could be a first step and template for growth for TikTok shop in Southeast Asia and around the world. And that seems to be the story here, Caro. You can do one example of cooperative working in one marketplace and then try and get around other regulatory hurdles in other markets. Yeah, how does this speak to what else will occur in Southeast Asia? How will it speak to, well, go to getting synergies with 125 million active users in Indonesia on TikTok? How will they leverage that? What does it mean for competitors? C, for example, that's some great analysis coming out of Bloomberg Intelligence. All right, coming up on the show, we're going to talk a little bit about the crypto rally and what this means for investing in the space with still marks Elise Colleen. Cara, what you got? Just checking out shares of Charter Communications sinking abruptly, now down 8%. We know the CFO was participating in the UBS Global Media and Communications Conference today in New York. We'll dig into that for you. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. A quick check in on the markets and actually some EV news that is driving markets. Looking at Tesla and Neo. Tesla rebounding in a big way this Tuesday, up 3%. It's snapping four straight days of declines, its longest losing streak since August. We started the morning with news that unions in Denmark are adding to the union efforts against Tesla in the Nordic region. Sweden has been uh, negotiating with Tesla over a collective bargaining agreement for about a month that Tesla has stood firm on. It was kind of weighing on the stock earlier in the session, or at least in pre-market, not so now. And then NEO, interesting one. The market's kind of cheering its cost-cutting efforts. It had a narrower-than-expected loss in the quarter just gone, but it's cut its outlook for the number of EVs it thinks it will deliver in the current period. It's a name that we track, not because they're delivering here in the US. They're not. But outside of China, they've expanded into markets like Europe. So we stick with it. And actually, in the crypto space, while we've been on air, Bitcoin has pushed higher through 43,000 US dollars per token, continuing to trade. Um, 
basically at its highest level since April of 2022, give it a day or two. What's interesting is over the last 24 hours or so in the risk asset context, equities broadly have been lower. But who cares? Bitcoin continues to march higher, Karen. And a lot of that is to do with anticipation of a spot Bitcoin ETF, of course, of halving next year, of many idiosyncratic things around crypto as well as the macro picture. Let's talk about, well, maybe some of the life it's breathing into the space. Still Mark founder and managing partner Elise Kalin is with us, we're pleased to say. And of course, you're all about sort of the picks and shovels being built around Bitcoin. You're about ensuring that it continues to build as an ecosystem. I'm interested in ultimately what the price point means for you. I'm sure institutional interest must be buoying your particular part of the market. That's right. So price operates in the background for us. We're really focused on innovation in the space and, of course, the appreciation of enterprise value in companies building in the space. And all of that also offers tailwinds for Bitcoin's price. So there's a bit of um, reinforcement there. In Bitcoin's price now, we're seeing the tailwinds of Bitcoin adoption along with macroeconomic factors at play. But as you noted, um, there's two important pending events that are also driving price appreciation here, which is the pending approval of a BTC spot ETF. And of course, the Bitcoin halving, which is projected to happen in Q2 of 2024. What the halving is, is a reduction in the reward earned by miners for securing the network. And that's historically been linked to price appreci appreciation. In the background of that, of course, are companies building in the space and technological advancements happening for Bitcoin, which will further drive adoption. It, the mechanism, I guess, is the unknown. But if we accept that the institutional money is now coming in and they found entry points to buy into Bitcoin, do you have any sort of forecast or sense of where you feel Bitcoin will go from this point on over the next 12 months? Well, it's hard to make accurate price predictions, of course, and there are important um, psychological and cultural milestones pending, like the $100,000 mark per BTC. What's important to note alongside that is that we've reached near all-time highs in terms of the number, the percentage of the supply that's not moving. So in other words, that means Bitcoiners, people holding Bitcoin, both institutions and individuals are not selling. Nearly 70% of Bitcoin in circulation hasn't moved in um, a year or more. And so that will, of course, provide some, um, some, some support on the floor as Bitcoin's price continues to appreciate. Institutional um, interest is not just for BTC, the asset, though. We have seen that leading up to this cycle, and we'll see that continue to grow in this cycle. But it's also for the adoption of Bitcoin technologies as well. And what's been exciting to see progress um, in Bitcoin's uh, bear market, what led us up to this point today, is that te technological advancements um, are coming in to allow greater enterprise adoption of Bitcoin, both layer one and layer two payment technologies. And so that, I mean, advancements in technologies such as Taproot Assets Protocol, which is a protocol designed and introduced by a Stillmark portfolio company, Lightning Labs. It yeah. allows digital assets like stablecoins to trade on the Lightning Network. And also advancements in non-Bitcoin or crypto technologies like ZK rollups, which can now be applied to Bitcoin and allow for more complex contracts to be executed on Bitcoin. Let's talk about that contract, smart contracts in particular, because that's sort of what everyone's always looked to Ethereum for. And many would say Bitcoin has been the sort of the OG in the space and found product market fit basically as a place you put money as an asset. But the problems that are being solved have sometimes been thought of elsewhere when it comes to trying to drive down transaction costs, when it tries to be an ability to speed up transactions as well. How are you seeing that applied to the Bitcoin ecosystem? Because many would say, oh, that's, that's Ethereum's job when it comes to smart contracts. How are you solving that in Bitcoin space? That's a great question. So what's important to note here, what's one of the things that's distinguished Bitcoin from crypto is that Bitcoin has always optimized for a secure, stable, and dependable protocol. And what that allows for individuals and enterprise is to engage with Bitcoin, the asset or the technology, in a way that they can be assured that things are not going to fundamentally change. So you can buy Bitcoin today, 
uh, pause for five years, come back and find your Bitcoin secured by exactly the same systems um, with the same exact rules applied. And that's very different from Ethereum or other altcoin protocols. Now, what's interesting is that we've seen enterprise use Ethereum or Solana or other altcoin protocols as sort of a test network for Bitcoin as technologies that allow smart contract execution on Bitcoin have matured. So I mentioned ZK rollups earlier. Really what that does is it allows for smart contract um, verification um, and compute to happen off of the blockchain. Now, when Ethereum was introduced with the premise of providing DeFi or more complex DeFi to the crypto world, ZK rollups were much less mature than they are today. But in the years that have passed, there's been an, uh, um, very significant advancements in that space, which allows for ZK rollups to now be applied in a Bitcoin environment. What that does for enterprise, it allows for them to move from this Ethereum testnet onto a more secure protocol with, while maintaining the same design space and functionality. This is very important because in order to offer an enterprise grade solution, you need not just the functionality, but the security of the ledger in which those contracts will be executed and reported to. And so I expect with these sorts of advancements, what we'll see is a much greater adoption um, with greater depth at the enterprise level where these technologies are used for core business practices or the development of um, more sophisticated products for retail. Still Mark Founder, Managing Partner, Elise Colleen. Great to catch up with you here on Bloomberg Technologies. And a reminder to the audience, Bitcoin passing through 43,000 US dollars while we've been on air. Crypto mining hardware retailer Phoenix jumped 35% on its Abu Dhabi debut, the first crypto related listing in the Middle East. That gave the six year old company a market cap of 12.3 billion dirhams. That's about 3.3 billion US dollars. The stock closed at 203 dirhams Tuesday, up from the IPO price of 1. 50. Beyond mining equipment, Phoenix also operates crypto data centers and recently set up the UAE's first fully regulated digital asset exchange, M2. Karen. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to talk, well, the world of AI, in particular ChatGPT for video. We'll talk about the launch of Pika Labs. Mike Mignano, you know him of Lightspeed Ventures. How is he looking to democratize the making of video, not just podcasting? And let's just quickly take a look at what's happening with Airbnb shares. Bit of a changing of the guard there, a, a, a shuffle up with the company. Now, this as we see a new CFO being named, elevated Ellie Mertz. She's been, of course, with the company for 11 years. Current CFO, Dave Stevenson, well, in January, he's taking on a new role, overseeing its business strategy, basically home sharing overseas. So think Europe, think outside the US as well. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. AI video startup Pika Labs launches with the vision to, quote, enable everyone to be the director of their own stories and to bring out the creator in each of us. The startup has raised $55 million to date, 35 of which were from a Series A round recently led by Lightspeed Ventures. Lightspeed Ventures partner Mike Mignano joins us now for more. OK, Pika is not the only company that does this, right? I think, as an example, Runway. Why do you have such conviction that Pika is the best tool, generative AI, for video content creation. Everyone on the internet wants to be able to create content. Uh, we've all been creating more and more content over the past couple of decades as creation has become democratized by technology and software. But video remains really, really hard. And that's why we're so excited by Pika, which is targeting all of us regular people as opposed to other products that are targeting more professionals and enterprises. And that's why we think the opportunity for Pika is just so, so massive. Okay, interesting. So, because you back a Lightspeed Stability AI, which is also doing similar things. We've got Meta and Google, I'm sure, are gonna be interested in creating video. What is the moat here? Is it about a team? Is it about how they've just ultimately shown more deep tech expertise? What is it that stands them apart? 
So if you look at the companies that have already generated massive amounts of value in, a, in AI so far, companies like OpenAI through ChatGPT or MidJourney and their imaging model, these companies all combine both their own foundational model combined with a consumer application, and that creates an incredible feed lap, feedback loop of content being created mm -hmm. and then delivered directly to the users. And that's exactly what Peak is doing. They have their own brand new video model, and they have their own consumer application. And so we think there's an incredible moat to be built through that approach. And I assume incredible amount of money to be built. <laughs> and I'm interested as how, how are they thinking of charging? Where will they be able to? Because we all know how costly this is to build this sort of technology. But how are they actually getting Gen Z in particular to part with money for it? Yeah, I don't want to spoil any of their surprises. But again, to go back to the two companies I just mentioned, OpenAI, they're rumored to be generating more than a billion dollars in revenue annually already. And they've only been in market for about a year. But the enterprise is some point for that. It's actually in a big part due to their consumer application, ChatGBT. So many of us are using that application now. So many of us are paying for the premium features. And that's the same with, with MidJourney. So there is a model being built here that's a new type of business model that is unique to AI products. We were just showing a video of Pika, and what's interesting to note about that video is that everything that we are currently showing on the screen is AI generated, right? That's right. How has this company scaled? If, if all of our audience on Bloomberg Technology is watching that and says, okay, I've got to be using Pika, will Pika be able to sustain and be able to handle this big jump in, in traffic or volume that our show might create for them? Pika Labs has been founded by two incredible Chinese-American women, two of the most academically decorated people in all of AI, Demi Guo and Chen Lin Meng. And I have full confidence in them and the team to build a product that is known, not only amazing for creating video, but also absolutely stable and um, robust from an infrastructure standpoint. So tons of confidence in the team. Mike, what can you tell us about the infrastructure? Uh, are they training on NVIDIA and H100s? What other silicon are they using? Who is their cloud partner in this instance? Uh, again, not something I really want to reveal. That's more for the founders to reveal. Oh, but, a, <laughs> but, a, but, but I, can, I can assure you that Pika is developing with the latest and greatest, their own state-of-the-art model, uh, and it's ready for prime time. More broadly, therefore, is this the area that you're continuing to gravitate towards the democratization of AI within the consumer base? As I talked about last time when I was on, I really believe that the history, of the, the history of the internet has proven that massive amounts of value become unlocked when companies democratize creativity. These companies, they enable anyone and everyone to create things that were pre previously very, very hard to make. And simultaneously, they unlock new formats that create tremendous amounts of value. And so we've seen this before through platforms like Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. And I think AI will usher in a new era of companies and value like this through companies like Pika and the company that I was mentioning last time, Tome. When it comes to the amount of content we have on podcasts, we have kind of you to blame <laughs> for that. So we thank you very much, Mike Mignano. Great to have him with us, Lightspeed Ventures partner. Meanwhile, look, sticking with Venture News, America's Frontier Fund, or AFF, has made its first startup investments through a new VC firm called Roadrunner Venture Studios. AFF is, of course, backed by the likes of Peter Thiel, Eric Schmidt, and is a non-profit investment platform focused on tech breakthroughs it deems to be in the national interest. First three investments through Roadrunner Firm, Hydrosonics, it's a clean tech startup focused on hydrogen production. We've got Inadis, a biotech company focused on cold chain logistics, of vaccine delivery, and Fab AI, an AI company for manufacturing. This is the less non-profit side of the business, though, Ed. That's the news coming up on the show. We'll talk the state of AI as Meta and IBM team up for an industry alliance. Arthur CEO Adam Wenschel joins next with his outlook as the AI startup unveils its own chat product. Let's go back to Charter. The stock down 8.4% had dropped as much as 10%. It seems to be based on comments that CFO Jessica Fisher is making at the UBS conference. Basically, the company seeing short-term challenges in broad brand broadband subscribers. They gave a more bullish long-term outlook, but they did see carryover churn in October. And November, according to CFO Jessica Fisher, has been similarly soft when it comes to broadband subscribers. A big drop in that stock in real time, based on those comments. This is Bloomberg Technology.
So Meta and IBM are joining more than 40 companies and organizations to create an industry group dedicated to open source artificial intelligence work. Now the focus of the AI Alliance, as it's going to be called, is responsible development of AI technology, including safety, security tools. Meanwhile, we want to talk about well, how you're interacting from a corporate level with AI. Arthur, for example, is an innovator in AI deployment solutions. It's unveiled its latest product, Arthur Chat. Joining us to talk through how they're benchmarking, firewalling, and indeed now offering chat is Adam Wenchel, Arthur CEO. And this, your offering is, okay, come to a company. We will help you decide what the right LLM is for you. We are agnostic. We're also going to help you sort of build fit-for-purpose chatbots. How, what is uptake like at the moment? And what is the degree that corporates want a diversity of choice given what just happened at OpenAI? Yeah, all, all great questions. So um, as you mentioned, the, the situation in OpenAI, OpenAI has obviously been crushing it, but it's really highlighted the, the, the risk and the way you need to manage it. If, just like any other technology, if you get too locked into a single vendor, uh, you expose yourself. And so being able to kind of choose the right tool for the job and have sort of a diverse approach to your, your generative AI strategy is really critical. And as you said, we're not trying to train our own LLM or foundation model. We think there's a really good ecosystem of those out there, whether you're using something commercially backed, open source, or even training your own, it doesn't matter to us. Um, but what we think is really important, what happens and we see over and over again, is people will develop these demos where they can get, you know, right out of the gate in a few hours work, they can get something that gives some compelling answers and people get really excited. Um, but then when you go from that really cool demo to a system that's actually ready from prime time and isn't making stuff up 10% of the time and isn't putting leaking data or giving toxic answers in some situations, that takes a lot more work. And we're trying to make that really easy for people so they don't have to, uh, so they can get the, the value out of generative AI more quickly. It's interesting that we just had the news around open source AI Alliance is being focused. How much is that conversation something you're having with clients? Oh, it's big. Yeah, most of our clients are experimenting with, uh, with open source models. Um, I think there's a real appetite for them, um, especially when people start to fine tune them. You can use smaller, more performant models. One of the big problems with these models is they can be a little bit slow to run. Mm. And so these open source people give, uh, give people a great foundation to build off of where they can create um, very effective solutions that are faster and potentially cheaper to run. Uh, and that they're, they're not, you know, it removes some of the risk about being dependent on a third party. And so we're seeing a ton of interest in it, absolutely. Adam, there's a big vocal group of people that think it's important to have choice for the foundation model LLM and it's important to have choice for generative AI tools. That said, are there just not too many chatbots? <laughs> there, are, there are quite a lot, you're right. There's a lot of excitement around this, but I also say, um, you know, it's, it's a big market, right? There's uh, pretty much every major enterprise has many, many projects going on in the generative AI realm. And, uh, and so I think that there's a lot of need out there. And so, you know, over time, uh, I think there'll, there'll be some, some clear uh, uh, winners emerging. Um, but yeah, I think that there's, that there's, there's just so much need right now in the marketplace for good tools to really kind of help people accelerate their, their ambitions. So one example case study for Arthur Chat is in the retail space, right? In other words, if you work in a retail setting, you can ask for the latest line of clothing. But it does raise the issue of training. You know, the response is only as good as the prompt that goes in. What are you doing around the training side? Of the human, not the model. Right, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of what we do is sort of evaluate to make sure that as people are going in and prompting, using the exact same kinds of prompts that, you know, whether it's someone in the retail fashion industry or someone in, you know, uh, re doing in, uh, financial research, you know, we, we look at the exact kinds of prompts they're doing and we have routines that will actually validate, make sure that you're getting the best answers to the exact type of questions that you're answering. And then, you know, in terms of training, being able when in real time to give people feedback on like, hey, how well supported is this answer by the data? Is this something that the model made up? Is this real? That goes a long way towards being able to roll it out to a broader population of users who don't have to be experts at, at kind of vetting the output of generative AI, but are just normal users who are trying to do their job and, and looking to get um, a speed up, get, get freed up from some of the more tedious parts of it and looking to accelerate what they're trying to accomplish. Adam Wenchel, it's great to have you in the studio. Thank you for joining us, Arthur CEO, talking us through well, how actually we're seeing adoption going of all these remarkable AI tools. But, I mean, what a wide-ranging conversation we've had, as always, on this show. But that does it for this particular edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. By the way, if the audience does feel there are too many chatbots, <laughs> post to us on LinkedIn or X, whatever it is. I'm interested in your opinion. And don't forget, recap the show on our podcast wherever you find yours on Apple, Spotify, iHeart. And of course, we're still posting the podcast 
to all of the Bloomberg platforms. Big thank you to everyone that does listen to the podcast on their way to work, on the subway, whatever it may be. From here in San Francisco and out in New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology.